Can you see and hear me okay? Everybody okay. nodding. Yeah, I see nodding. <laughs> all right. Um, I chose Where Have All the Pickles Gone as a title because to me, pickles are special in Marshall County. I don't know if you know that uh, our, our, our festival was almost called the Pickle Festival instead of the Blueberry Festival. And wow. It came down to those two being the big things in the county. And as a blueberry grower, I kind of <laughs> glad they chose blueberry. The reason they didn't choose the pickles, I understand it, was because there were lots of other pickle festivals, but there wasn't a blueberry festival as a stepped up in Michigan. So that's why they ended up going with blueberry. But anyway, pickles are very a part of Marshall County historically. And that's why I chose how agriculture has evolved in Marshall County and how things have changed. I was also, originally I was asked to talk about the uh, stick to in this of agriculture and why it was a huge industry 150 years ago and still a huge industry in Marshall County and how we're, how we're so, our fortitude as farmers and we're just so great we stick to it. Now, really, us farmers, we're not really that good in that. We were just lousy quitters. We just don't know. We are just lousy quitters. And we will, you know, the old, the old joke about the old joke about the, uh, you know, the farmer that wins the million dollar lottery. You know, they're just going to farm until it's gone. <laughs> but this is this is kind of the attitude of farmers when we do this. Um, but I do want to get into talking about pickles, and then we'll talk about highest and best use, which is why we've always been able to continue to adapt, and we have adapted. Now, I, I find pickles really interesting because it is one of those crops that you go back 120 years ago and it was a whole family thing. You would have this is an old traditional pickle field here. That's a relatively large one. Um, uh, but your family, uh, by the way, this is H.J. Hines in Walkerton. He came out and talked to his growers. Uh, but you would have a 40-acre farm, and you would plant somewhere a quarter or a half or up to an uh, acre. And I think the average pickle size, you go back to the 1920s, the average pickle farm size was, was one acre. But there were a lot of people that did a half acre. And you did it because the wife, mom, would, mom and the kids would pick them. Um, and even, even when you think about management and, and if you're, next slide, yeah, that when you pick pickles, and I did raise pickles for the pickle factory here, you know, you, you make decisions as to whether or not you're going to pick a small one and get a whole lot more money for it. You can imagine how many kids you had and how eager they were to pick determined a lot on which size of pickle you would pick. You'd make a lot more money per bushel with this, but of course you get a lot more bushel with this size pickle. So even the housewife back then, 120 years ago, was making a decision as to how we're going to pick our pickles, and if we if we don't pick for a few days, if we don't pick for a few days, then we uh, we're, we're going to have to get less money, but we'll we'll have more. So it was a management thing; it was the whole family was involved with it, and you every pickle station. Okay, this is the Tippy Canoe receiving station, and it was very important that the pickles had to be salted and brined as quickly as possible after they were picked. So all along the railroads every small town would have a pickle receiving station or a brining station. Really small towns might just have a receiving station where they'd be thrown on the train and immediately taken away to be brined right away. But like Bourbon, Tippecanoe, Gibbard, they had receiving and brining stations where they would, they would bring in their, their base pick and they'd brine it right away. And then it'd go in the rail cars, the barrels that they're brined in would then be loaded up and sent off to a central uh, packing station where they actually bottle and can, which is why, again, I chose pickles we held on to one of the last pickle factories in the in the country. I well, there's there's one left, major one left in Indiana. There's some, there are some uh, boutique pickle makers, but uh, there's one commercial factory left in Indiana. You say brining as opposed to pickling. Is that a separate step? No, brining pickling. I, I consider the same. I consider the same process. Just, just oh, basically throw them in the brine and getting them getting them uh, pickling uh, into the vinegar and the salt brine. So. But that needs to happen quickly. So they had these stations around where they would do it along the railroads because that was the artery to make things happen. How long would they have to remain in the station? Oh, now you're going to act like I know my pickle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how long it takes to brine. They, once they're in there, they can stay a long, long time. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's obviously it's a way to preserve it. The, the pickle, I mean, it's, it's done to preserve it. So, you know, um, you know early, early in the agriculture when I was growing up, I still had a neighbor that had you know, that had the two cow, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of this, but what we've seen in modern agriculture, what we've gone for, when you go back 120 years ago, everyone had two cows and, and a chicken house and, and all this. And so uh, you, you were self-sufficient. We're going to get into a lot of those statistics later, okay? Uh, uh, this is a modern pickle harvester. You see, uh, uh, well, I, I don't think we're even growing it. I don't even think anybody's growing pickles anymore in Marshall County. I grew pickles for a while. 
for, for processing. But uh, obviously, we're no longer one acre pickle farmers. So we've seen this whole process. And of course, our pickle factory. Next slide. Yeah, this is our, our what Pilgrim Farms Bay Valley that it just closed a couple of years ago. So we had a long run with pickles in Marshall County. Is there a reason why the farmers each grew, you know, maybe one acre as opposed to a whole entire farm? Well, it was it was it was the economic of the picking. You know, if you the more wow. kids you had, the bigger the bigger field you would have because it was the family. This was how they would make the money. You know, another way the family could make money on a small acreage. It was more labor intensive. Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, pickles are very labor intensive, especially hand picking, and they utilize the families to to pick it. That's why it was a. Uh, it was social. It was a. Uh, you know, it, it fit into uh, the farming that we were doing here because you could put a, a half acre, quarter acre. So it was all a function of how many kids you had to pick, basically. Um, what people ask about agriculture in Marshall County and how it's changed over the years because you have pickles, obviously, and there are many other. We have lots of tomato growers. We have lots of things. But what I want to come down to is talk about highest and best use for our land. We look at Marshall County historically. A lot of Marshall County, we're in an area where there were a lot of swamps that were drained in the 1800s. That gave us a lot of really good, rich, mucky, high organic land, which of course was very good for onions. And we had lots of onion fields go back 120 years ago. We produced a lot of onions in this area that we'd all be trained out east. They'd be trained. We were sort of the wild west there. Uh, I mean, you go to the 1920s, Iowa was the greatest uh, state in apple production. So, you know, that the, in 19, of course, then it went uh, west for highest and best use. The, the products have all gone west. We used to be uh, huge in processing tomatoes in Indiana and, and uh, the onions, because when they drained the swamps, we had a unique soil that was excellent. So the highest and best use for these drained soils and the markets were onions, especially root crops. Uh, here's we show some muck. This is a muck farm and an old tractor with the muck tires. You see there's no wheels. They're dragging on sleds because it was easier to drag through than try to roll things through the muck. So they would actually drag tools. Um, some other things that there were used to be a lot of maple, maple sugar camps, maple syrup camps. I think there's just one left in the economy now that's uh, commercial. But it used to be virtually everywhere it's had a maple camp because again it was something we could use in our local area. All right, um, I'm going to go through some just general things we know that farmers are getting uh, much larger. This shows just how extreme they were farm size versus uh, uh, the number of farms and the farm size. As we see, the times change. Farms have grown. Obviously, much, much larger. We all know that. But again, that's the economies of scale. Uh, next slide. I like, I like this one because it shows, goes back to 1900. This is an index. It's not an actual yield, but this is an indexed uh, yield of, of uh, uh, corn, wheat, and cotton. And you see it up until the 50s, we were pretty steady in our production. In the 50s, well, that's when I was born. I figured they must have known how much I was going to eat uh, <laughs> because... <laughs> Production has just steadily increased in our major crops, and that has just been uh, consistent of agriculture and agricultural production since the 50s that we've just greatly increased. One of the things that this brings down to me is, is that when I was when I was a young man, uh, we were still thinking about feeding the world in starvation. And I, I love that we have in agriculture or the people, the population, we've become so spoiled. You know, it used to be that we were worried about hunger and starvation, and now we're worried that the corn syrup is going to is going to kill us. We've become so spoiled. We no longer have to worry about if there's going to be any food there. We worry about which store has the cheapest half gallon skim milk in plastic. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we worry about now. We don't worry about a store ever having milk. No, that's the starvation and the, the famines of the, of the Great Depression are just not even in our thinking anymore. And um, uh, this has come about because we just really have just incredibly increased our ability to produce. And now we're getting more picky about what we are actually producing. You want to talk a little bit, Jamie, about what caused that, that increase in production? Was it just all mechanization or? Well, it's just been all kinds of uh, genetic improvements. I mean, virtually all aspects of agriculture have become more efficient and better. Genetics, uh, fertilizer, fertilizers, uh, uh, the chemical for weed control, 
Um, you know, you go back to 20 bushel, 30, 40 bushel corn, which was the norm for years and years and years. Now it's 200 bushel corn. A lot of that is the genetics of the corn as well as the other modern practices. The big part of that is, was norm. Is the land normal. in this area better suited to corn than to other kinds of products? And that's why we've settled on that now? Or should we be? What's the highest? Why, why wouldn't you drive down the road basically see corn and soybeans? Right. I get this. It really is the highest and best use. Where did the pickles go? They closed down a factory here. They closed down one in southern Wisconsin. They moved to central Michigan. They kept that one open. Why? Because in Michigan, they still grow uh, a lot of vegetables. Minnesota, Wisconsin, because they have shorter uh, growing seasons, they can't mature a full crop of seed field corn like we can. So they grow a lot of vegetables up there where they can utilize the shorter growing season with good ground. Again, highest and best use of land. We are in the corn belt. There's a reason it's called the corn belt. It is a great place to grow corn. And we can grow it better than they can in central Michigan or northern Wisconsin or, or virtually anywhere in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And that's why the Valley of the Jolly Green Giant is in Minnesota. You know, it's uh, um, Minnesota's number two in, in production by tonnage because of the green vegetables that they can raise there, the shorter season crops. So the reason we have corn and beans here is because it's highest and best use for this land. And that's what I wanted to get at. We've always been the highest and best use for lots of things. The onions, at the time, it was the highest and best use for our land. Um, I think we have a question. Yes. Uh, did somebody have a question? I thought I heard someone say something. I was making a comment about the Green Revolution in Norman Borlaug. Yeah, go ahead with that. Well, you, uh, someone asked what was responsible in the genetic side, of, I would say, would be primarily uh, Norman Borlaug and his colleagues work uh, that in the Green Revolution productivity of land. Yeah. Not a question, it's a comment. Comment, yeah, yeah. There's been huge, I mean, obviously there's been huge advances. You could talk about what's the, I, I, you could talk about that for days, well, all the things that are going to contribute to increased yields. And production. Luther Burbank is another one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Size of farms, we know that the vast majority would, um, I've got a few slides here that I just wanted to talk about. When you see statistics on agriculture, you got to be really careful on what you're seeing because these, when it comes, this is from the U.S. Census of Agriculture, you see that less than $1,000, 20% of the farms sell less than $1,000 a year. And that's considered a farm by the USDA. We hardly would consider that a farm here, selling less than 1000 That's somebody who gives... Maybe they mm -hmm. give writing lessons so they can deduct their, their price right. expenses. They give writing lessons so they have some income from it. But the uh, U.S. considers lots of lots of farmers, people farmers that I guess I don't normally consider farmers. So you got to watch when you go to statistics. But you look down here, 4% of the farmers are farming a fourth of the acreage, which is what we know. We're getting fewer, mm -hmm. bigger, huge farms. But uh, Jamie? statistics, uh, I'm sure you understand because I think the farming statistics are very oftentimes very stilted because you have all these 40 percent of people that I would not consider an economic um, entity but yet you'll see them in the statistics when it comes to farmers another comment Did, I just was going to say that currently in, uh, USDA uh, if you sell a bushel of apples you're a farmer <laughs> wow if you sell a bushel of apples you're a farmer I, I think if you uh if you have any income at all, that was what you're saying, right? Any income yes. is considered a farmer. Yes, because oh uh, uh, a census used to do it, but they were going to limit it at ten thousand dollars income to be a farmer. So USDA took it back, and now if you sell anything, any income, you can be a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no minimum, basically. There's no minimum. There's no minimum. Yeah. Well, this, this is why I was, I was trying to show here that a lot of people that they call farmers statistically, we would not consider. Farmers here. I mean, I even get it that well, you know, me being a fruit and veggie guy and a nursery guy, that I have in, in, the, in the coffee shop is, well, we're not talking about me, we're talking about real farmers. And I've, <laughs> I've often wondered, <laughs> it's like, I understand what they're saying. I go through corn and beans, which is considered the real farmers in Marshall County. But, uh, <laughs> I own the tractor. Yeah. 
Hey, thanks for the clarification, Bob. What was that? I want to say thanks for the clarification, Bob Yoder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said it much better than I was trying to do with numbers and graphs. I figured Balka was going to be here, so I had to have a bunch of numbers. And graphs. He's not even here now, so. <laughs> okay. You went All right. Um, I got this slide up, although it's, it, it's showing the percentage and the jobs that are involved in food production and serving. See, obviously, food service and eating and drinking established 13 million jobs, largest section of the food sector. But here's one of those things that I, I think are one of the real things that have happened in the last 120 years. This is equal to 10 point, uh, 10, 11% of U.S. employment is bringing food to the people. You go back, this was like 95% in 1900. Now, historically, the thing that I find interesting about this is no society, culture, or economy can evolve any faster than they're able to take the population away from just providing basics. The most basic one is food. So when you look at when we were using, if you go back 120 years ago, 95% of the population was needed to get the rest of the, to feed the population. Now we're at 11%. So all those jobs that have opened up, you know, they were all in agriculture. They've all been allowed to go to other things and help the economy grow and and uh, achieve what we've achieved in our culture and our society. And this is true with any culture as you watch it develop, that the way they can only grow as fast as they develop their agriculture and are able to feed, feed their people. And this is probably the greatest uh, we've ever seen as far as a change in going from 95% to about 11% wow. to feed the population. This is now, we're, now we're going to look at just Marshall County statistics. Again, you look at the number of farms that are under 2,500 in sales. It's, uh, uh, it's a third. If you look at a third, are basically, uh, or 40% are under $5,000. And I think under $5,000, you're not really an economic farm. Uh, you get down to the number of economic farms. A third are what we would call modern farms in the county. Size, one to nine acres, and then we go to the thousand acre plus, we have about 53, what I would call commercial farmers, what we would normally think of as commercial farmers in the county. And that, that is not just um, grain farmers, that's um, animal farmers as well. Correct? Oh yeah, this, well, this is just looking at acreage. Yeah. It's not looking at the net at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. It has that number changed a lot in the past, say, 20 or 30 years? Are Marshall County farms consolidating? Yes. Yeah. And I, I had a slide earlier that we alluded to some of that. Yeah. Some of that, uh, the consolidation is getting larger. Um, so th this area is not an exception to that no. general rule. But one thing, one thing unique about Marshall County is if you look at the size of farmers and just think of the farmers you know, if you go to the north, our, our farmland up here is sandier, hillier, a lot more lakes, ponds, rivers. And if you go this way in the south, you got larger, bigger farms. We can actually see the highest and best use. You know, we see a lot more animal production in this corner because of the acreage and the highest and best use for the land. You see a lot more animal production in the northwest corner and the, and the west side than we do on the, on the east side because we have a lot flatter, more open land. The, the value of land is worth about twice as much over there than it is over here too. It's uh, we have we have a lot of diverse agriculture even here in Marshall County versus going to like Tipton or something where it's just prairie soils and corn you know, everywhere. It's... Okay, here here's just a little bit about the percent in Marshall County. Internet access is on there. We two percent of our farms claim to be organic. Seven percent sell directly to the consumer. Uh, and that's right, but the national average is 8%. So uh, farmers will sell direct to consumer, 25% uh, higher uh, farm labor, and most are considered still family farms. Uh, the crops we grow, it's corn and soybeans, as you can tell. That is, that is what we grow in Marshall County, at highest and best use for what we have. Is there a special reason why it's, it's 
feed corn rather than, I mean, you don't see any like popcorn or. or well, we grow a tremendous amount of popcorn. popcorn. Do we? Oh, yes. really? Yeah, okay. we grow yeah. a lot of popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, I saw that statistic. I don't, I can't, but we know we, we grow a lot of popcorn in Marshall County. Um, didn't know if we want to talk about farmsteads and how we've evolved here. Um, the uh, early settlers, of course, you had your log cabin and you were, um, uh, I like the thatched roof here in the back. <laughs> um, I said when I was a kid, my neighbor was really nice because we still had one of the last 40 acre farms, I think, around as the neighbor where they had the separator. We milked the cut two cows, you'd milk the morning and night, you'd separate the cream. They, uh, they had the chicken. And it was just truly the old 1920s farmstead. Fortunately, we don't have those around anymore. They were, they were lots of fun, very interesting because you really saw how you did feed, how you, how you fed yourself and how you fed people. Um, <coughs> we're starting to evolve a little bit with more out, outbuildings, more specialties. There's a smokehouse in there that would be built. Um, the comments here, I, I, I appreciate comments as to... Uh, any memories you have on this? You know, we had 75 cows in 1920. This would have been a huge dairy. You notice the advent of the silos coming in in the 20s. Go to the next one, which I think is the a, size of the barn, really. Yeah, the size of the barn, much. The size of the herd, as much yes. as anything. The storage for your, your winter hay in the loft and such. More modern one, 50s and 60s harvest stores, which is. Definitely a dated thing. They were very popular for about 20 years, and then um, it's, uh, it, it dates a farm when you see a harvest store. What was the purpose store. of a harvest store? I'm assuming a harvest, harvest store would store wet crops. You could store wet green in there for food. Um, it, it never, uh, I think it's safe to say it never really took off like the harvest store company wished it would have. They've since been used for like wet holding bins, but it was, it was a way to. Uh, store a, a higher moisture uh, product. And of course, this is the Homestead Dairy. They were basically turned into our, our farmsteads of today, but nothing like the ones of the past. They're basically factories and look like, look, uh, look like factories and large, uh, large businesses anymore. The farmsteads just aren't the are the beauty, beautiful thing that we used to see. They aren't passed on from family to, to from father to son as much as CEO to CEO, right? That's interesting. I, I don't know statistically how I would say that. I don't know. That's certainly uh, the case with the Homestead area. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know statistics on that. That would be something to, to study as to how they are. Homestead Dairy is still a family farm. Yes. Oh, is it? Yes. Oh yeah, it's a family. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It is going to be passed in yeah, generation. CEO, CEO. Yes, yeah. I mean it, within the family. Right, yeah. right within the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was. I looked up the statistic yesterday about how many cows there are out there at the Homestead Dairy, and the source that I fairly reliable source, eighteen hundred cows, and you contrast that with the with the previous dairy farm they had. What was it? Seventy five. Right. And those both would have been, those are both very large farms for their time. For their time, yes. Yes. The milking at Homestead is all robotic. So that makes a big difference in terms of how many cows you can reasonably handle. Jimmy, where is that? Just south of town. Just south of town by the racetrack, south of town. You know where the Humane Society is? Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, okay. I know where that is. Okay. I didn't realize that was the name of it. Another aspect, yeah, another yeah. aspect to the Homestead Dairy is they have multi-site farms. Uh, so not every, not all their operations are in one location. Their heifers are raised uh, over by Napanee out to be ready to come back to the herd. And they have the legacy farm up north where they start out their heifers and then they bring them there to be trained to be in the robotics. So it's it is a different operation now. Bob, do you do you have any, uh, what percent or, or how many farmers are in Marshall County are being passed down to the next generation? It was one of the comments that was here. How many are being generational and 
Um, do you have any statistics on that or any comment? Well, a lot of a lot of the 53 larger farms, I mean, it, it may not be going down to like the Redinger farm is probably going to be passed on in family, but to another family member outside of the original family that started that farm, for example. It's a nephew that's farming with, with uh, John Redinger now. So yeah, it, in some situations, the children aren't the ones that are going to uh, be the next management level. It could be a, a cousin or a, a niece or nephew, for example. But I don't have the percentage. I don't think we track that. USDA doesn't. So that'd be our source. But a lot of our farms are still family farms, though. It just may not be the traditional. Just like Price Nursery, originally it went from an uncle to a nephew, and then they had a, there was no one to pass that on to or no one interested to have it, so it went on to three business members. So that's what happened to that, that nursery, for example, which is different than just being a family operation. When you get to the size, the difference between, again, this, this farm and the one with 75 cows, you've got this, these problems of scale that start to appear, right? How do you get rid of all that manure is one of the, one of the bigger problems. Can you speak to that at all? Problems of scale? Uh, Bob, you, Bob, you'd be the one to comment on the, on the economies or problems of scale. The factory farming uh, yeah, idea. The, I mean, we have a few of the larger, we have homestead dairy, and we have our, the hog operation over by Bourbon. Bob, what else is there for major? Well, <clears throat> large livestock operations, you got to be approved by Indiana Department of Environmental Management. And the biggest issue associated with those farms is how the uh, natural nutrients are going to be managed. Uh, so the, how is the manure output is going to be uh, stored. And then that nutrient, which is a great farm nutrient, how is that it's going to be applied in appropriate fashions. And uh, we're, we base it upon the level in the phosphorus in the soil. So once it's at 300 pounds uh, phosphorus in the soil, manure cannot be applied to that ground. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. And in, in our horticulture, in, in food production, you know, boy, you can't use any of it anymore. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah. You know, we're, we're producing food to sell directly like, for direct consumption. Uh, it used to be a major part of, the, of no. What? It, it, it has the E. coli in it. It has like if you look at the, the 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 problems we've had with the recalls, like with the lettuce, most of that has been down to livestock. Bob, would you would you support that? That most of the contaminations we've had have been from livestock or fecal matter onto like the lettuce and-, and, and well, Like spinach uh, and stuff. It's, it's yeah. in the water they use for irrigation. And that's part of our national, and you know that this, Jamie, the national, our food safety plan that your water has to be tested now to use as irrigation water uh, to make sure that it is contaminant free. So that's a new aspect that we're managing in agriculture now for uh, produce production in particular, stuff that's grown and directly uh, marketed to the consumer. When I had my food safety, my one of my last food safety audits, I was deducted two points on my score because I didn't have my irrigation water tested. I didn't have a record of having my irrigation water tested. And at the farm, I don't have any irrigation, but it didn't matter. I still lost two <laughs> points because it wasn't tested. And that was an automatic two point deduction. So um, yeah, these, I've been through these food audits. Uh, some things you, you may not know about your food. When you buy a, a pint of blueberries in the store, uh, not so much on the package that you're getting, but on the master crate, they can go back with the coating on that crate that, that comes into the store that they pull the box out of. They can tell what data was picked and which field and which farm it came off of and which field on that farm. My farm up here was broken up into, I think, 15 different fields. It's only 35 acres of blueberries. It was broken up. Uh, in all these fields, and I had to like say what day everything has to be known. So if there's a problem, they can take it right back. And so virtually any produce now that you would buy in a Kroger's or a Martin's or whatever, they can get back to the field and the date that was picked in. That's part of the food safety audit. So they can chase back, you know, no more of this like having to just take all the spinach off the shelf. They can go back to the farm and the date and get right back to it. So do you think there's significant 
problems with buying from our, our local farmers market in terms of I I I I know I, I see no problem. I, I see no problem with this. I think that growing up on the farm, we we've <laughs> we've we've gotten very spoiled about what we think is going to hurt us. And, uh, no, I think farmers markets are great. One thing I've seen in my lifetime, of course, when I first started, we had to be local produce had to be cheaper. We had to be cheaper than what was in the store. Thank goodness we've gone we've moved beyond that to where people know that local produce is better and they're willing to pay more because it is more expensive to grow locally and to grow smaller volumes. But we can make a difference. I can pick blueberries completely right. The way I pick and sell blueberries up there, the stores will not even take them because they won't have a two-week shelf life. And they want to see red on the back and, and, and blueberries will turn blue, but they won't get any sweeter. But they will get sweeter if you leave them on until they're completely blue. But yet, like a Kroger buyer would never buy what I sell because it wouldn't have, two, it wouldn't have that multi-week shelf life. So there are reasons why you buy local. And I, organic was the big buzzword, but the last four or five years, local has become just as big a buzz as organic. In other words, buying locally and knowing what was on there. And I think when you are buying at the farmer's market from someone who has pride and takes ownership in that product, I think it's uh, perfectly safe. So I, I don't worry about that. Bob, you got any comment on that as far as food safety and what they make the big guys jump all the hoops we had to jump through? Um, uh, I got out. Well, the, of, the reason why we don't uh, regulate farmers market as much as we would a, uh, uh, a, a commercial. Sorry, my phone's ringing. Uh, is that you can ask the, the at the farmer's market, you're talking to the grower. So you can ask him questions on how he raised it and managed it, his cult, his varieties. Uh, so uh, buying locally, you really get to know the person that's growing your food. So all your questions can be asked and answered. Or if I go to the grocery store, it, it can get traced back, but I really cannot talk to the grower on how they raised it. So that's the advantage of farmer's markets. And the variety of cultivar, like Jamie was saying, uh, we have cultivar of tomatoes that are excellent to eat, but they don't have shelf life. So they can't go in the traditional grocery store marketing side. It seems to me that uh, the Amish and Mennonites are able to uh, compete even today against highly mechanized uh, factory farming. Um, is there a reason for that? Or, I mean, are they just, is it the labor difference or what? Well, I always say that uh, in the Amish and Old Order Mennonite community, children are assets and my children are lovable liabilities. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they, they, they uh, you know, their, their biggest challenge is growing their business to accommodate uh, future generations to uh, have their own home and farm operation. So that's their challenge. Uh, and they, they do use technology uh, like uh, cultivars. We have uh, a program on August the 12th at uh, Titus Oberholtz's farm. He's growing uh, peaches in high tunnels uh, to get uh, consistent peach production every year instead of worrying about temperatures. Peaches are marginal for our climate so he's correcting that issue by having them in high tunnels. I will, I will, I will also say that uh, uh, normally Amish Mennonite, they are sewing at a good price. And that's huge compared to like when you go into the market, like most people who ship their produce off now, they have no idea what they're gonna get for it. You know, it just goes off and whether they whether they grow to a co-op or sell through the different, you know, whether it's uh, uh, nature ripe or uh, or uh, uh, Driscolls in, in berries, you know Driscolls are major players, but they they just they pick and they ship and they end up getting what they get. And the uh, Amish usually you're in more control. Smaller, I'm going to say smaller growers. So the Amish fit it. like me. I am a specialty type producer. I get a better price. I mean, I'll, I'll get a better price than I would that if I was just selling through a a, a Blu-ray co-op or something. Mm -hmm. So you, you tend to have more security over your markets and over your price and more control over what you're getting. And they've uh, even had some of those issues too, Jamie. Uh, 
They, a lot of them sell through the auctions up in uh, Wakarusa, mm -hmm. but I knew one was going through a, a broker and he was, he was having the issues, the one going through a broker because uh, they were taking their cut in the process, you know that, when they're uh, handling uh, produce in the, before marketing it on. So most of them are doing exactly what you're saying, directly marketing either through an auction house or in other fashions. Most of the guys that I, in my experience, that have been really successful are ones that the more they control their marketing, uh, people come to me on a, a just virtually on a weekly basis. You know, I bought 10 acres, what should I raise? And first thing I say is, what do you like? You know, because you're going to do a lot better job if you're something you like. But the biggest thing is you have to develop your markets. It's in specialty. Now, I, I really didn't know if we wanted to get back to specialty crops. But in specialty crops, you have to develop your market uh, first. And, you, and I, I tell people that you should always choose a customer that needs you as much as they, you know, as you, as they need you as much as you need them. You, know, you should not grow a field of pumpkins here in San Francisco and sell to Walmart or Kroger's. No. They don't need you at all. You should you should choose your markets for your size, and uh, have your markets developed because it's easy to grow. Um, it's easy to grow sweet corn, and I've had people come when I was doing the farm markets. I would have somebody come with a pick and load of sweet corn in the middle of sweet corn season and say, "Just give me something for it." I go, "I don't need it. I have all the sweet corn I can possibly sell." <laughs> he said, "But just just give me anything. Give me ten cents a dozen." It's like you don't understand. <laughs> just don't need it. I mean, you can't, you know, you just can't, put, you only push so much at one time. You have to have those markets developed before because when they, when they come around trying to sell stuff that fits, you know, you, you can only use so much in the season. Are, are there now cultivars that are designed to, to come ripe at different? Oh, periods? sure. Almost everything has different. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. There's lots of sweet corns and well, like when I was raising sweet corn, you even had like any one variety might only be fit to pick for three or four days. Now you can pick the varieties for two weeks, some of them. Um, uh, strawberries, there's early, late, mid blueberries. Um, the, the early blueberries are all done by the time the late blueberries even start as far as yield. Almost everything has the different days. There's a little bit of time left. And so I, want, I would wonder if you'll talk just about blueberries for a while. Just the, the cultivars and what the different kinds of blueberries that you that you raise and what they're good for. Okay, uh, well, I'll start even more basic than that. First of all, like blueberries are a very region, regional product. It's one, one of the few crops that was, let's see, Bob, what was it? Blueberries and tobacco were the two North American, uh, native to North American that now are around the world. I think other than that, you know, like corn was Central American, tomatoes were South American, potatoes were South American, but. I think it's tobacco and, and blueberries were one of the two or the two unique North American crops. Watermelons, uh, melons are all Asian. They're they're desert actually. They were really? semi-arid. Uh, is where they originated and developed. Uh, the blueberries they they don't have any hair roots. They don't have a tap root. Blueberries grow naturally along the edge of a swamp, not in the swamp, but grow on the edge of the swamp. And of course, we had lots of natural swampy grounds here, and we had lots of good natural. They they all also need a low pH, uh, which is very uncommon. Uh, we have that we have that naturally here. Low pH is the acidity of the soil. And where corn and beans like a seven, blueberries like a five or five five, which like it's just a very, very unique soil. And we have those soils here naturally, which, which again, why do I grow blueberries up there? I'm not making much on my blueberries. They don't do very well in that muck hole, but it's the highest pH. You cannot drive a tractor through that muck hole. There's not much else I could really do with it. So I still consider it the highest and best use for that land. Uh, if, you go, if you go up to Purdy, Tillman's, which is not Purdy's, their muck used to be covered with blueberries and it wasn't that good. Their blueberries are up on the higher ground and now their blueberries have all been put, or their low ground is put in the reserve program where they're not farming it because it's just so difficult to farm those, those muck lands, wetlands. In my research, I've come across uh, a lot of references to the Huckleberry Marsh yes. that was west of here somewhere. Well, they were everywhere. They, the huckleberries were growing in these, in these swampy at the edge of swamp. I mean, you go this way, yep, you, know, you go east here, there's a lot of swamp out there. Yeah, yeah. it's all been drained. I mean, of course, you go to the Kankakee, it's, it's massive of what they drained. But this all got drained out here too. But we got the ditch system, the county ditch system got put in, drainage system. We cleaned up a lot of the natural huckleberry marshes, which that's just the wild blueberries, huckleberry. And I can oh, really, you, you can go, uh, 
there's a huckleberry out in the mountains that they call this different than our huckleberry. There's a huckleberry is a, a term that I'm given to lots of local native Vicinium. Uh, cranberry and blueberry are Vicinium, it's their uh, scientific name of the group. And uh, uh, they all like this, this sour soil and grow in similar, similar climates. Uh, but the huckleberry is a word that is used uh, on lots of different things I've, I've discovered around. <laughs> Uh, what they call a huckleberry, but it's basically a wild vaccinium blueberry, small, small fruit. So, what about other kinds besides I mean, the kinds of blueberries that you grow and what their uses are? I know you grow more, more than one variety. There's, I mean, there, there's probably commonly grown, there's probably about 50 varieties commonly grown around. Uh, there, um, there are varieties that are for processing. You know, one thing that we don't think of like when, when they talk about the low bush blueberry, which is what they grow in Maine, uh, and it just it, it, it doesn't grow very tall at all. It's called low bush. Uh, some people call it wild. We don't like to call it wild as a high bush because they do cultivate them. They burn them, they prune them, they fertilize them, they spray them. They're very much cultivated. But it's the low bush, low bush, right? They're small berries, and processors like the small berries. Some processors pay a premium for small berries because you don't want to have in a muffin, you don't want to have a huge a huge mass of blueberry you know you want to have a small blueberry you want to have those little seeds so, so sizing the blueberries is important you know, but there are lots of different varieties of blueberries that are virtually just as different as a uh, granny smith apple and a red delicious apple but you can get them there are some that are very tart and uh that are bakers really like those um but for so eating out of hand you want eating to out of hand you normally get the sweeter but there are many different types of blueberries uh, Mostly not chosen for size. If you look at a picking star, you don't think about this, but when you pick the blueberry off, some of the older varieties they would be really juicy and meek, which of course is horrible when it, when it goes in and meets in a, in a package. They they would also tear some. So we talk about a nice dry picking star as an attribute that you like in a modern blueberry. Um, the bloom uh, on the blueberries that you see, which is that waxy cover, some people think it's pesticide residue, but that bloom shows. Uh, there's a variety called Blue Ray that I really like, except it has a lot of slick, what we call slicks. It doesn't have the bloom, which is that wax. And if you look at that with an electron microscope, the wax coming out of the Blue Ray just looks like a, you're squeezing a tube of toothpaste and the little waxy part comes off. Now, the reason I'm going to this is that when you overhandle a blueberry or it's too ripe, that also rubs that wax off. So buyers would look at a slick and say, gee, these have been old, you know, these are old and been overhandled because the wax is gone. And some varieties just don't have as much as others. But again, that's a desirable trait is to have that wax or bloom, it's called. Um, so you look for that on varieties. Um, there are different varieties for, for different heights for ornamentals. Um, also, if you have you want to grow in Wisconsin, and so there are the half eyes where they collect the snow and get covered with the snow uh, that protects them from the winters. So there's a lot of talk these days about native planting. So in your the landscaping that you know you you want to go toward uh, plants that were native to this area and not invasive um, like the fire bush now is considered invasive and that bread prepare and all those so to is there a, a kind of blueberry that you could plant in your landscaping that would um, would be yeah. a good one for that the, 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 the term now is permaculture which is the buzzword term for Having an edible yard instead of something you mow and contribute to the to the, you know, the carbon problem we have here, that you plant your yard and make it edible. Uh, there are different blueberries you can use for landscaping. We have blueberries that only grow a foot tall, not grow, you know, grow ten foot tall, um, and some have been chosen for the red bushiness of it. Yeah, so there are. Uh, so I could put it in my landscape to watch the pH of the soil. That's the biggest problem. Is you got to like if you're if you're a gardener and you know rhododendrons are hard to raise. Rhododendrons also like the sour soil. There's very few things that actually like the sour soil. That's interesting. The sour soil is just uh, it, it. You have to have the right pH for the ability of the plant to take the nutrition up. Like if you have a blueberry. That is growing on a high pH. You know, say, oh, it's an iron deficiency. It's an iron. Oh, you, know, you have the leaves tested. Coming back as an iron. You can throw all the iron you want over there. If the pH isn't right, the plant cannot utilize it. So the pH is what determines the ability of a plant to use the nutrition that's there. 
So even if the nutrition is there, if the pH is wrong, the plant cannot do life. So that's why pH is so. Bob, you want to be more scientific than that or not? <laughs> All right, we've got like five minutes. <laughs> if anybody has any more questions, we just... Where did the pickles go to? Who grows them now? North. Yeah. I, and I did, uh, uh, this is just a, a conversation with somebody from the Bay Village or, or when I saw the, their name on a name tag at a, at a convention, I really wanted to drill them because I was, I was wanting to know whether or not it had gone foreign. Things like processing asparagus has all gone to Chile and, and, and Peru. I mean, we don't do processing asparagus anymore, really. Hardly anywhere in this country. Some some commodities have just left. Again, highest and best use of the labor. They have much more readily available. The asparagus is still something that's picked pretty much by hand. And uh, it, it, we've exported it all. So I wonder whether these pickles had gone offshore. And they said, no, they're still producing the pickles here. They just consolidated the, the factory operations, but they did not. And again, he told me this, but I still would like to, to verify it somehow that they're not just getting stuff shipped in from. From China or South America or something, they are still growing the pickles here, but they've moved everything north. Which again, the short days, you know, you can double crop down here, but still, when you look at highest and best use for the land up there, it's it really does lend itself to something more shorter season like pickles. Is the difference Pickers. between dill pickles and sweet pickles the brining solution? It's not the uh, not the. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to claim to be a pickle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is a difference. Yes. In, yeah, well, I mean, it is a difference in how we buy it. Yes, of course. But as far as going into it, what percentages and what's there, it's a, as a pickle canner. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I can tell you on a on a home canning scale that yeah, the dill pickles use vinegar and dill yeah. uh -huh. and some other spices, and sweet pickles use a lot of sugar. Uh -huh. Do you use and the same cucumber? For same either. cucumber. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's vinegar. It's always vinegar, but you're going to get a lot more sugar with your sweet pickles. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming if that's how it is in my kitchen, that's probably how it is in a factory <laughs> as well. So, you know, you can use pickles as a really good thing to, to spice up a, a meal, but be aware that if you're eating sweet pickles, you're, they've picked up a lot of that sugar, you know, so it's not really good for you. And, it's and like, Candy. Where have all the pickles gone? It's also where when I raised pickles, I raised about 40 acres for them for a while, and it was all hand picked. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that has gone is the hand picking. So everything is done, <laughs> everything is done with the you know mechanical harvesters and such. So well, yeah, growing up in Michigan, I think I remember a high spray of column. Is that still there? I don't know, but there most of those plants have all been consolidated and have gotten very large, so I don't know. We had, I think when I was growing processing tomatoes, uh, I think I had the option of 16 different companies I could have gone to in the 70s and early 80s, and they were dwindling, and now there's basically one buyer. It's Red Gold. They're about the only, I think they're the only one that's left of any size. And they're in but, Indiana. Yeah, they are an Indiana company. They're down at Elwood and the rest is. They, they encroach on the... Uh, G Strat Porter's home in Geneva. Oh. <laughs> well, how dare they? Yeah. <laughs> you can see it from her backyard. All right. Any more questions from our virtual audience? I'm not seeing any. All right. Thank, uh, you. <laughs> thank you, Jamie, for presenting today. Uh, be on the lookout for our next brown bag next month. Uh, that will be with Jenny Harness, and she will be talking about um, Eva Kaur, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor, and that'll be on. Thanks for coming today, guys.